Strategy, tactics, technique. They all work together, or they don't work at all. In part one of this series, we'll focus on strategy. And in part two, we'll consider tactics. And in part three, we'll see how technique ties it all together. Technique, tactics, strategy. Now, for any of this to make any sense, you have to understand the difference between these three things. Strategy is the general overall plan for accomplishing your goal. Tactics are the choices you make in the process of pursuing your goal in accordance with your strategy. Technique is the effective and efficient execution of every action required by your tactical choice. Back in the late 70s or so, I read a book by Paul Maslach called Strategy in Unarmed Combat. Uh, this is still one of my favorite books on the subject. Klaus Witz has got nothing on this guy. The positional theory of combat strategy that Paul Maslach describes made immediate sense to me. It was like tripping over the Holy Grail. And I, I realized right away that combat strategy applied to a lot of non-combat situations. Strategy is based on the pre-existing physical relationship between the opponents. Can your opponent outreach you or can you outreach your opponent? The fighter who can reach the farthest is the longer fighter. Is your opponent stronger than you, or are you stronger than your opponent? The fighter who can do the most damage with a single action is the stronger fighter. So that gives us four possible strategic positions. Longer and stronger, longer but weaker, shorter and stronger, shorter and weaker. Four strategic positions, four viable strategies. Your job is to select a strategy that will optimize your chances of success if you use it correctly. No strategy will guarantee your success. No one strategy is inherently better than any of the others. Each strategy has its advantages and disadvantages. When you're the longer, stronger fighter, your strategy is offensive outfighting. When you're the longer, weaker fighter, your strategy is defensive outfighting. When you're the shorter, stronger fighter, your strategy is offensive infighting. And when you're the shorter, weaker fighter, your strategy is defensive infighting. Now you can't select a strategy unless you know your opponent's reach and strength. And that's the purpose of intelligence gathering. You might have a lot of time for that or you might have only a split second. But either way, you have to assess your opponent and yourself objectively, without bias or prejudice or judgment. Frankly, most people can't do that. They can't see past their own assumptions and beliefs and preconceptions. <laughs> or as my dad liked to say, he can't see the forest through his bullshit. But every good fighter can and must make that kind of objective assessment. So if objective critical analysis is the only thing you ever learn from practicing a martial art, then you're still coming out way ahead of the curve. It's very possible that your physical attributes may lead you to specialize in one strategy or another because you find yourself often in that strategic position. But that may not always be the case. And your strategic position could change during the course of the fight. For example, if you get injured. So it's a pretty good idea to know all the strategies. Now, if you didn't know any better, you might think that the longer, stronger position is the best place to be. And most people don't know any better. All they know is what they see in the movies and they, they never question what they see. 
Now, certainly the longer, stronger position has its advantages if the longer, stronger fighter uses that strategy correctly. The strategy of the longer, stronger fighter is offensive outfighting. You fight from your longest distance. Never allow your shorter opponent to get close enough to hurt you. Because you're stronger, and possibly also faster than your opponent, you make no effort to disguise the time or manner or direction of your attack. That is, your attacks are direct, and each one is made for maximum effect. Your goal is to drown your opponent in a tsunami of overwhelming force. If I had to pick an archetypal example of offensive fighting, I think it would have to be Sonny Liston. The strategy of the longer, weaker fighter is defensive outfighting. With defensive outfighting, you still maintain your longest distance, but you have to be indirect. You often employ deception and compound attacks because your opponent can defend against simple actions, and your simple actions lack sufficient power. You only use simple actions as feints to force your opponent to commit to a particular defensive movement, and then you strike at the opening he leaves behind. You rely more on the accumulation of damage to defeat your opponent rather than the one-punch knockout. No surprise here, my favorite longer, weaker fighter is Muhammad Ali. The shorter fighter always has to find a way to penetrate within his opponent's longer reach. He has to get past his opponent's offensive capabilities. He has to get inside. Now, sometimes a longer fighter can also be successful at infighting, but a shorter fighter will never be successful by outfighting. The shortest, stronger fighter wants to get inside and stay inside, delivering powerful, direct, undisguised attacks hoping to land a single crippling blow. And he's willing to absorb some punishment on the way in, confident that he can take his opponent's punch. I think my favorite example of the effective, shorter, stronger fighter would be Rocky Marciano. Despite having only a 67-inch reach, he retired undefeated with 49 wins, 43 of those by knockout. Also, the fight between Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson is a, is a master class in strategy. You'll see an excellent, longer, weaker fighter against an excellent, shorter, stronger fighter. You should study that fight. Now, the shorter, weaker fighter would seem to be in the worst possible position. He has to get inside to be effective, but he can't withstand his opponent's strength on the way in. And he can't stay inside and, and trade with his opponent because his opponent is too strong. The shorter, weaker fighter has to use every possible manner of evasion and deception to get inside, strike where his opponent is the weakest, and then disappear before his opponent can respond. The shorter, weaker fighter has to be a master of the art of invisibility. He's the magician of combat. Now you see him, now you don't. The shorter, weaker strategy is the strategy of the gorilla. It requires patience and caution, as well as decisiveness and agility. This strategy can and has defeated longer, stronger opponents throughout history. The gorilla's primary goal is usually to force the enemy to withdraw or to surrender by, by making the conflict just too expensive to continue. The shorter, weaker strategy is a campaign of attrition. You bleed your longer, stronger opponent dry by a thousand small cuts. You protect yourself until your opponent is drained and exhausted. Willie Pep was a master of this strategy. Muhammad Ali, despite having a small reach advantage, 
used this strategy very effectively against George Foreman in 74 with his uh, now infamous rope-a-dope tactic. The shorter, weaker strategy was also used uh, rather effectively by a handful of upstart English colonists who rebelled against their lawful king and eventually defeated the greatest army of the time. Maybe you heard about that one. It was in all the papers. Here's what to remember about strategy. Number one, choose the right strategy for your strategic position. Number two, using the appropriate strategy optimizes your chances of success, but nothing can guarantee it. Number three, no strategy is any better than any other strategy. It's all about how well you execute that strategy. That's what counts. And number four, any strategy can succeed, and any strategy can fail. In part two, we'll take a look at tactics.